Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the Ultimatum Game's assumptions. The Ultimatum Game is the simplest version of bargaining you can possibly write down. As a result, we're going to be analyzing it a lot in this course, and it's something that I talk about a lot in the book as well. The book associated with this course is Game Theory 101 Bargaining. If you're following along, we're now in Chapter 2, and if you're not, you can find out more about this in the video description. So what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? Well, if you've bought into what I've told you in the last few lectures, we should be thinking by now that modeling bargaining is a great way to learn about bargaining power. But in order to analyze a model, you first need to write that model down. Unfortunately, any interesting strategically interdependent situation is growing, going to grow really complicated really quickly. Bargaining follows here too. Bargaining dynamics get really complicated really quickly. So if we start with the most complicated model possible, we're really not going to be doing ourselves any favors. We're really just going to be shooting ourselves in the foot. The solution, on the other hand, is to start small. And that's what we're doing here. We are going to start small with the ultimatum game. So what is the ultimatum game? Well, if I challenged you to write down the simplest version of bargaining possible, the best you could possibly come up with is a single ultimatum or a take it or leave it offer. So specifically what I mean here is that one side is going to make a proposal to divide whatever it is that they're trying to negotiate over. So for example, if we're talking about a wage at a job, one side is going to say, hey, how about this wage for me to work for you? And that's all that's going to happen in terms of proposals. The other side will see the offer that's being made and either accept it or reject it. So if you accept, you're like, yes, we're going to settle on that amount that was proposed and that's the end of it. We've agreed that that's the amount that you're now going to be paid. Or if you reject it, that's the end of the interaction entirely. There's no more bargaining. There is no more negotiating between the parties. They are done. They cannot make an agreement at all. It is over. This is the simplest version of bargaining you can possibly write down. Now, when we're going to actually start analyzing and solving this model, we're going to be talking about bargaining over a car. So if we actually just do this really quickly for some intuition and see an example about exactly what's going on here, what is an ultimatum game, we can think about it like this. Imagine that Barbara owns a car. And in fact, she values that vehicle worth $4,500, but she's willing to sell it. Meanwhile, Albert wants a car, and in fact, he sees Barbara's vehicle, and he likes it, and he's willing to pay up to $5,000 for it. That's how much he values that vehicle, $5,000. And if we're looking at an ultimatum game, the way we're going to structure this is that Albert will make a single take-it-or-leave-it offer, an ultimatum, to Barbara. He'll say, hey, Barbara, I would like to buy this vehicle for X dollars. Barbara will say, hmm, X dollars. Yes, I accept. At which point, Albert will buy the car from Barbara at that price. He'll write a check for X dollars and Barbara will take that check. Or Barbara can say, mm, you know what? I don't like that. Sorry, we're done here. In which case, Albert does not write a check. Albert does not purchase the vehicle and Barbara drives away with her car still. Notice here that when these two parties are negotiating, Albert and Barbara are negotiating, deals should be possible because there's $500 in surplus. In other words, Albert values that vehicle at $5,000, which is $500 more than what Barbara values it at. So when we're actually going to be analyzing this, they should be reaching a deal. The question is, which deal are they going to wind up on based off of the ultimatum game? And if we're using the ultimatum game, as the title of this lecture implied, we have to care about the assumptions. So, as we've been talking about heavily to start this lecture, Albert is making a single ultimatum. This is the most critical of all the assumptions that we're making here. Albert makes a single take-it-or-leave-it offer, and that is it. In some contexts, take-it-or-leave-it offers, ultimata, are actually realistic. In some cases, these offers are not realistic. This bargaining over a car example is one example where it's not particularly realistic. In the real world, if Albert were to offer a price that Barbara was like, yeah, you know, I don't really like that very much, there's nothing that stops her from saying, hey, Albert, you know what, I appreciate that offer, but how about we do it for this number of dollars instead? Nothing stops her from doing that in the real world. And so as a result, one thing that we're going to be working toward is figuring out what happens when you do have the ability to make these take-it-or-leave-it offers. 
On the other hand, sometimes actually the ultimatum game is a fairly realistic representation about what goes on in the world. In fact, in the book, I have two applications that are actually pretty insightful on what goes on when we have these sorts of ultimatum offers. I talk about, uh, what is it, security deposits with landlords and also legislative bargaining. Those are a couple of situations where these ultimatum offers are actually pretty realistic. And what we're going to see is in these situations, things turn out very badly for the guy who's receiving the offer the one who's saying yes or no to these offers. And we'll talk about that more and we'll actually see it when we start solving the ultimatum game. Another assumption that we're going to make to start off this analysis of the ultimatum game is that the parties are only going to be able to negotiate over whole dollar increments. So if Albert is writing a check to Barbara, he can't write a check for, say, 4503 cents. It's just got to be $4,500 or 4501 and so forth. Now, this is not a realistic assumption. In fact, a more realistic assumption would allow them to negotiate over cents as well. But as it turns out, in most interesting bargaining environments, being even restricted to cents is not particularly realistic either. Think about a wage, for example. Would you rather work for $25 an hour or $25 and one half cent per hour? You'd rather work for the latter because those half cents will eventually accumulate. Similarly, if you're a firm and I'm a firm and I'm selling my widgets to your firm, I would much rather receive a third of a cent per widget than a quarter of a cent per widget. So realistically, there's actually an infinite number of different possible divisions when you start breaking down those cents into fractions of a cent. And we'll talk about more about what happens when we have that sort of freedom to negotiate over those fractions of a dollar or fractions of a cent. Lastly, and this is not that bad of an assumption, I don't think, Players are only going to be maximizing their own economic welfare when we're analyzing these models for the most part. I'll talk a little bit more about this when we start comparing the results from the ultimatum game in theory to what happens when people play it in experimental laboratories, but I don't think that this is a particularly real, unrealistic assumption because after all, when you're negotiating over the price of a car, you really don't care about how good of a deal the other side is going to receive. You only care whether they're going to say yes or no to your offer. So you might care about whether they're going to say yes or no. You know that, for example, if you go in to buy a used car and you say, I'd like to buy this car for $1, they're going to tell you, heck no, get out of here. So you do care about the other side's decision to say yes or no, but you don't really care if the other side is getting a great deal or a bad deal. In fact, you'd be very happy if the other side is getting a bad deal and you're getting a great deal for yourself. So this isn't an unrealistic assumption, but again, I'll talk about this and compare this to the experimental results later on. So those are the critical assumptions that we see in the ultimatum game, and in the next lecture we'll actually get to solving the ultimatum game. We'll draw a neat little game tree that looks like this, and we'll see what happens when Albert and Barbara go to negotiate over this car. Hope you enjoyed this lecture, and hope to see you next time. Take care.